I know nothing about Kirby. I've never played one of the games, but Kirby is my main in Smash and one of my favorite Nintendo characters. So it's time I learn a little bit of something. So we're gonna watch attempting to explain all of Kirby lore in a single video. I'm gonna see how much I can learn. Long ago, in a time before pink puffs and air rides, there lived the ancients, an entire civilization ancients, completely gotcha. in mystery. Save okay. for a few key relics they left behind. But who cares about any of that? Because on a right. related planet far, far away, there lived an innocent pink puff named Kirby, a being. Okay, so he just like happen. hangs out on a planet. That's a good boy. This is some ancients over who knows in yonder. Or he usually likes to spend his days eating, sleeping, or some variation of the two. However, yo, me too, dude. A certain self-proclaimed monarch would steal all the food in Dreamland. Initially. What? You can't steal all the food. This can be rebellions going on. That would be sure to last an eternity. Or it wasn't us. Like it. As while King Dedede would be the first antagonist of the Kirby timeline. Okay, that's Dedede. Okay, I know him. An actual villain and more of an ally slash punching bag for Kirby to wail on in just about every game in the series. So he's like the Bowser of this game, basically. He's the dickhead that you fight in every game. Is whether it be he's a king as well. To prevent Kirby from releasing an actual nightmare demon or just be possessed by an otherworldly force, this king never oh. seems to oh, catch a Though speaking of possession, that brings us to our first real piece of Kirby lore, Dark Matter. First revealing itself dark in matter. Dreamland 2, Dark Matter is an amorphous dark entity, more often than not taking the form of a black sphere with an eye in the center. At first, especially in its debut, Dark Matter seemed to be a pretty simple antagonist what with its only goal being to shroud the world in darkness. If anything, the most sinister Pretty basic. thing about Dark Matter is the fact that it could possess whoever it wanted to do its will. Incl Why didn't you just possess Kirby then? Including and usually limited to King DDD. Oh, come on. Just possess Kirby, you idiots. I wonder if Dark Matter was like made by the ancients as some kind of experiment gone wrong or something along those lines. I, that's my prediction right However, now. While the first appearance of Dark Matter was more of a lone force, attacking Dreamland solely because it was lonely and had no friends. That's actually Aww, real, by the way. It's so in Kirby's sad. In 3, the next installment of the Dark Matter trilogy, we would finally begin to see the bigger picture in terms of this ambiguous villain. Enter Zero, the supposed source and leader of Dark Matter, who, much like the one before it, targeted Dreamland in an effort to engulf the planet in darkness. Though unlike okay. the lone Dark Matter that had attacked before, Zero comes much closer to completing its mission, with the planet becoming fairly engulfed before Kirby put a stop to it. But how exactly hey, did he put a stop well to done, it? Mate. Well, let me explain, because yes, this is important. Essentially, Dark Matter in general, alongside being made up of well, dark matter, are beings of concentrated negative and energy eyes. and emotions, making their only real weakness the opposite of that. Posi Which is Kirby, because Kirby has never been sad ever. Positive emotions. Just take the aptly named Love Love Stick, a weapon forged from the gratitude of- Oh, is that- that might be why you can only possess DDD, because DDD's a bit of a dickhead, and he's angry about getting dunked on by Kirby all the time. Can't possess Kirby because he's a being, being a positive emotions. It's the antithesis. That makes sense. Everyone Kirby helped along the way, which proved to be the downfall of Zero and its cronies. However, that that being said, not all Dark Matter are necessarily evil. Take Gooey, for example, okay. a member of Dark Matter that somehow broke away from Zero's control altogether and formed a will of its own. How did Aww. this happen? Well, we'll just have to go into that later because we've still got a lot to cover. Next okay. up, after Zero was seemingly I just came out! Jesus Christ! Brutally annihilated on Popstar, a similar force began to attack a faraway planet known as Ripple Star, engulfing the planet, much like a certain orb we all know and love. Unfortunately for them, though, Dark Matter struck fast this time, and Ripple Star ended up completely succumbing to its invaders, safe- Ah, well, because they didn't have a Kirby on deck to kill it, I guess. For one inhabitant that escaped with the only means to stop them. Now, I won't give you a complete summary of Kirby 64, since aside from Dark Matter possessing some familiar faces and the mysterious ruins on Rock Star, there really isn't that much to unpack in the beginning. Instead, it's towards the end of the game that things really start taking a turn for the dark when Kirby arrives at the fifth planet in the game, Shiverstar. Because I mean, it kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Plus- Wait, it's- is it Earth? No way, right? Hey, I guess this kind of explains where Adeline came from, or at least- Oh my her. god, it's Earth. Dark Matter just claps Earth's cheeks? That makes sense. We are very negative. Have you seen Millennials? They can't stop make, making killing themselves jokes. Ancestors. Though moving on to the corrupted Ripple Star, after defeating Miracle Matter and expunging the planet of all Dark Matter, the Dark Star reveals itself with a familiar face at its core. But hold up, <gasps> Zero, he's Zero back! destroyed in Kirby's Dreamland 3? Well, kinda. In the case of 64, it's heavily 
implied, Zero was revived using the body that was cast away towards the end of its first fight. So after yet another mildly disturbing battle in a game made for kids, he's like Palpatine. He just comes back when nobody wants him to. Dark Matter was once again supposedly defeated, never to return again. At supposedly. Or two. So taking a step back from Dark Matter, let's talk Kirby Superstar. Now, lore-wise, there isn't that much to be had here, what with most of the sub-games being standalone stories, like Dina Blade or Revenge of Meta Knight, where Meta Knight attempts to start an actual war just to get Dreamland's inhabitants to be less lazy. But on oh, okay, well, what's a Meta Knight? I mean, I know him from Smash, but like, where did he come from? He kind of looks like a little Dark Matter. Undoubtedly, aside from those, the most important- Is Meta Knight maybe another manifestation of Dark Matter that gains sentience, like the little uh, blobby dude? Sub-game within the game is Milky Way Wishes, where Kirby is tricked by the scheming jester Marks into summoning Galactic Nova, a mysterious clockwork star of then unknown origin. You see, once Nova is okay. summoned by someone, it has the, the power ancients. to grant one wish. No that was made by the ancients, I'm calling it right now. No matter how small or large. So in turn, after Marks got the sun and moon to fight each other in order to trick Kirby, literally all it took was him jumping in to say his wish first to turn the seemingly harmless machine into a force of mass destruction, with it taking the uh -oh. might of both the sun and the moon to stop its advance. Though of course- That reminds me of the Dragon Balls, actually. If you come in and you just wish something from Shenron before someone else can, you just get the wish. You get beaten up even if you found all the Dragon Balls. Even with all that said, the both of them never stood a chance against the seemingly bottomless pit of power that is Kirby, as he quickly defeated them in no time at all. And why is Kirby so powerful? I, I, I guess that'll be explained in this, where Kirby actually comes from, or if he's just a thing that just doesn't have any lore. That's really weird. He's super strong. But it doesn't end there, because 12 years later, Kirby Superstar would be remade into Kirby Superstar Ultra, bringing with it a massive new load of information Meta to add Knight. on to the existing story. Simply put, with Superstar Ultra came the beginning of one of Hal's favorite new ways to sneak in lore where you- Why does that dog lay eggs? You'd least expect it. Pause screen descriptions. And while they wouldn't exactly be very lore heavy this time around, say for one in particular, they'd become far more important in the following games. But pause screens aside, most importantly, with Superstar Ultra came four completely new sub games on top of the original seven. There was. Dude, there's so many Kirby games, it's ridiculous. Give your suggestion if I had to play a Kirby game, which one do you think I should play? Revenge of the King, a direct sequel to the very first game in the series. Helper to Hero, a version of the arena only with help. What the hell is that? Arena, Jesus Christ. An even harder version of the normal arena. And the star of the show, Meta Nightmare Ultra. Where for the Meta Nightmare Ultra it goes so hard as a name, that's ridiculous. The very first time, you get to play as the infamous knight himself. Now, Meta Nightmare oh, nice. Ultra is a bit of a tricky case, since technically the events that take place in it aren't exactly- Oh no, he's Star Destroyer! Instead, they're more of a what-if scenario, where the events that take place within the modes flesh out certain aspects of the lore while never- What-if scenarios are so cool! Again, I have to go back to Dragon Ball! I love what-if scenarios in Dragon Ball, just what-if scenarios like, what could have happened if this, this, this? I get super into them, they're awesome. What's your favorite what if scenario from, I guess, Pokemon. There's a lot of Pokemon viewers here. What if this happened? What if this happened? What would you like to see? Canonically taking place within the main story. Case in point, Galactonite, the final boss of the mode and strongest warrior in the galaxy, sealed away due to fear of its Strongest warrior in the galaxy. Never made an appearance in the main series canon. Though at the same time, that doesn't mean he doesn't exist somewhere out there and could very well show up in the main series canon at any time. Kirby Kachuru literally Rina exists. He can't be the strongest. As well, serving as a what if scenario with the conception of Mark's soul. A stronger version of Mark's who after surviving the explosion of Nova absorbed its power to get revenge on Marx? Wait, Karl Marx is in this? Dude, after he wrote that communist manifesto, he jumped into a Kirby game. Good for him. Kirby. And as great as all that is, by far the most important aspect of this is his new pause screen description, as it contains some pretty heavy foreshadowing. To quote, he absorbed okay. a Nova's power to bring back his evil soul. No and Nova's? Is the Knights the Nova? Is Zero the Nova? He didn't absorb Zero, no sure. It says a Nova's instead of the Nova's. While there is a chance it could be a translation error, considering the events of future Kirby games, I'm not so sure. Though we'll get to that later, because next up on the chopping block is Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, an incredibly important game in terms of lore, as it contains the first instance of the Mirror Dimension. To start from the- Oh, a Mirror top, Dimension? Okay, that's cool. Dreamland, there exists a mirror portal into the Mirror World, a complete reflection of Dreamland, including Mirror World counterparts to its inhabitants. One day, after sensing a dark force emanating from the mirror, Meta Knight took action to stop the evil at its source, Let's go, Meta Knight! into the mirror world, Woo! only to be immediately ambushed by his evil counterpart, Dark Meta Knight. Plus oh no, th there can't be an evil Kirby. I'm calling it there's no evil Kirby because he's too pure to be an evil version. There's no shot. Had insult to injury, he'd also come out of the mirror to attack Kirby as well. Oh man, come on, dude. versions of himself, much like another certain Nintendo game that came out around this time, but similarities oh, aside- okay, I got it. You're following the trend, are we? We need a four-player co-op game. After journeying through the mirror world and defeating Dark Meta Knight once and for all, the true mastermind is revealed, Dark Mind. And wouldn't you know it, it's not he's zero. the mirror world equivalent of Zero. 
Merrill. He is. Wait, but zero was evil. So the mirror world equivalent of zero should be good. Unless it just doesn't work like that, but I guess. In the mirror world, much like Zero corrupted the normal one. Though thankfully, once Dark Mind was defeated, the mirror world was left in the hands of Shadow Kirby, who would continue to protect it in Meta Knight's and Kirby's stead. No, no. Oh wait, so sh okay, Shadow Kirby is good. So I guess the mirror world, I guess mirroring doesn't exactly mean the opposite. It just means there is another version. That makes sense. Nothing bad will ever come from the mirror world again, right? Well, right. All I can say is we'll get to that soon. Moving okay. past Amazing Mirror, Canvas Curse, and Mass Attack, since the latter two are pretty much contained to the themselves, we arrive at Kirby Squeak Squad. At first, <laughs> this game seems to have Great another name. pretty self-contained story. What would Kirby That cake is gone. No, where'd it go? Kirby chasing after a piece of stolen cake that a gang of thieves known as the Squeak Squad stole from him. Kill them, murder them all. Kirby, you have the power. Kill them. However, as the game progresses, do murder on them. And upon the treasure they assumed would grant infinite power, it turns out they'd get more than they bargained for, with their leader, DeRoach, being possessed by Dark Nebula, a member of Dark Matter that had been sealed away in a forgotten era, left alone for eons. Ah, so... Zero wasn't the last one. There was some more Dark Matter just chilling and hanging around. And much like the rest of its kind, Dark Nebula would be no match for Kirby, being absolutely decimated by the Triple Star. So now Get with clapped, all those idiot. bits and pieces of lore out of the way, it's finally time for the next massive truckload of lore in the form of a little conniving alien who crash lands on Dreamland. Enter Maglor, the main villain of Kirby's return to Dreamland, who solely through dialogue reveals a lot of important stuff. But before anything else, let's talk about the ancient. First preferred. Finally, we're getting some ancients lore. God, I was. I was gagging for it. As such by Maglor, the Ancients were a highly advanced civilization who mysteriously vanished at some point in history due to an unknown cause. Oh, sounds like the Prometheans from Mass Effect. Any Mass Effect players? On Halkandra, a planet extremely far away, hidden in another dimension. Now, coincidentally, Maglor also says he's native to Halkandra as well, though considering his history- Is he one of the Ancients? Or is he a liar? ...with telling the truth, that could very well be false. So he's a liar then. <laughs> take his ship, the Lore Starcutter. While it does seem he's telling the truth about obtaining it on Halkandra, Rather than excavating it in Dangerous Dinner, he most likely just stole the thing and heavily modified it into a weapon to kill Landia, an endeavor mm. that didn't exactly have the best results. This was also later backed up in Star Allies when the lore in Lore Starcutter is revealed to mean Paradise, confirming the ship was not intended for battle. Though it God, we're getting so much information just blasted into our face. This is- I'm trying to take it all in, in if I can. string of dialogue that he reveals that, he also mentions something very worthy to note. Alongside the Lore Starcutter, the Ancients were also responsible for a plethora of other amazing relics of untold power, with clockwork stars and items that bring dreams to life being t Oh! I knew it! I called it! I said the ancients made the clockwork star! I, I said that, right? I said that! references he gives. Off the bat, that connects quite a few dots. Plus, on the <laughs> side note, so proud of myself. conditions on the extra mode for Return to Dreamland, Maglor mentions he actually came to Dreamland already knowing about Kirby, with someone he knows very well having fought with Kirby in the past. Based on these implications and some other- He knew someone that fought with Kirby? I mean, there was the rat, there was Zero, there was- I guess Man Knight, maybe? There's King DDD? I'm not sure. Oh, and there was the other guy, the guy that ate the Nova. Ugh, I forgot his name already, but that, that one. ...found in later games. This mysterious figure is most likely Marx from Superstar. Call Marx! Yes, I knew it! Essentially confirming that he survived the explosion of Nova. So fast forward a bit through the story, and once Maglor tricks Kirby into defeating Landia for the Master Crown it protects, he immediately puts it on the first chance he gets, activating the crown and transforming into a much more sinister form, intending to call Oh, he looks good, though. He's drippy found power. However, like those who seeked relics of untold power before him, Maglor wasn't exactly aware of the Master Crown's true nature. And as his battle with Kirby progressed, does it have Dark Matter, like, imbued within it? Is it gonna take over his body? Because that's what they do, they possess things. The crown began to show certain traits that weren't present before when it was under Landia's nullifying effect on it. Maybe it's the sudden appearance of an eye on the front of the crown, or like the Dark Matter creatures have. Maybe it's the fact that it's clearly gone from a crown to an irremovable headpiece. But whatever it is, there's yeah. no doubt that the crown itself is sentient, and rather than Maglor utilizing its powers, it's the Master Crown itself utilizing Maglor. Just take the third I swear to God, it's Sock Man. After Maglor fails to defeat Kirby, even with the power of the Master Crown, the crown takes things into its own hands, completely reforming hey. Maglor into a projection of itself. All but Jesus confirming Christ. the origin of the Master Poor Crown's guy. power with a certain characteristic that sometimes appears within Maglor's mouth. All in all, Maglor definitely learned never to play with the powers of literal dark gods oh, he's ever dead. again. And he's dead, dead. And went on to pick up the much more positive venture of building
Oh no, he's not dead. How is he not dead dead? An amusement park. So yeah. Oh, I'm in an amusement park. That's so great. Make Kirby land. That got pretty dark in more ways than one. If only I could say things get any better from here on out. Next up, we'll uh -oh. be heading to the scenic heights of Floralia, a group of six floating islands that Kirby finds himself in after his house was swept up by the Dreamstalk. The only problem is, alongside Kirby, King Dedede was also swept up with a spider-like mage named Taranza. King Dedede can't catch a break. All he wants to do is eat some good cake, and then he goes and gets clapped by every single villain that's ever existed. Taking him for the hero of Dreamland and kidnapping him as a result. You see, while Floralia he's the, yeah, dude, he's the there, hero. it's actually ruled by a tyrannical queen who will stop at nothing to assure her rule is never disturbed. Ah, Overall, Wonderland. a seemingly simple plot for a Kirby game, all things considered. Well, at least it appears that way. Once the main story reaches its climax and Kirby meets the vanity-obsessed Queen Sectonia, there's clear- She's wearing a crown! That's not the master crown, but who knows? Clearly something off. Especially considering the queen would go as far as to physically fuse with the Dreamstalk solely in an attempt to preserve her beauty for all eternity. Well, to find the answers to this mystery- Hey, I mean, I want to I want to be beautiful for all eternity. I want to keep these devilish good looks for all eternity too, you know what I mean? <laughs> we will need to look at the other modes within Triple Deluxe, because much like Meta Nightmare Ultra before it, Triple Deluxe brings DDD to her. Another what-if scenario where the mode shows what would happen if King DDD climbed the Dreamstalk instead of Kirby. Now, much like its Meta Knight counterpart, the only real difference in this mode is its finale, where after defeating Queen Sectonia, out of seemingly nowhere, the dimension mirror from Amazing Mirror appears, forcing DDD to fight the, it's the Shadow Dimension! Of himself, shadow DDD. And that's not all either, because after defeating Shadow DDD, the king actually enters the mirror itself to reveal an even edgier Dark Meta Knight. Hungry. He, oh, dude, he got scratched on his face. Oh, a cat scratched him. Oh, no. For revenge. But what does this all even mean? Well, let's take a step back here and start from the beginning. Based on information spread across a variety of pause screens, before the events of Triple Deluxe, Queen Sectonia wasn't always a tyrannical- I just love that as a way to accumulate information about lore is like, Well, I've done many researches on many pause screens. Monster bent on world domination. In fact, she didn't even look the same. Instead, looking much like her then best friend at the time, Taranza. You see, at this hey, point, Taranza actually had feelings for Sectonia, and as a gift Aww. to her, went into the mirror world and stole the dimension mirror, not knowing the mirror actually served as a prison for Dark Meta Knight who ever since being defeated had been festering in there, slowly but surely corrupting the very mirror itself with his hatred. So in turn, Damn, he's so angry. What's he so angry about? From Taranza, it slowly began to change her the more she gazed into it. Soon, dissatisfied with her current form, she'd use magic to make herself more beautiful, resulting in the wasp-like appearance you see her with in the game. And once she gazed okay. into the mirror- Okay. Wait, that doesn't- I mean, does the mirror think that wasps are beautiful? Mirror got like a wasp fetish? What's going on? Enough, just about every shred of her former self had vanished, being replaced by an endless hunger for power and beauty. Fast forwarding it's unfortunate. Back to I'm the sorry to hear that. The main story, the Sectonia you see here is but a husk of her former self, with even Taranza realizing that the only solution to save both Sectonia and her subjects is to help Kirby permanently put an end to her. While it's definitely a victory, you got a killer? Doubt, does Kirby kill people? Has he ever done that? Is that a thing that Kirby does? He does murder? The sky people finally being freed from Sectonia's iron fist. For Taranza, it's bittersweet, since although he knew it had to be done, he can't help but mourn the loss of the one he loved. So oh, yeah. Yeah, dude, that's, first off, that's very, very sad, and secondly, Kirby does murder! Oh, yeah, wasn't that delightful? If you thought that was depressing, just wait until you see what's next. Long after the events of Triple Deluxe, Popstar was once again at peace, its inhabitants living out their lives as they always have, when suddenly, out of nowhere, the sky was blotted out by something immense and spherical in shape. Ex okay, I'm pretty convinced that Meta Knight is not part Dark Matter, made sentient. He just kind of looked like it since he had the, you know, black. Except instead of that sphere being made up of a matter most dark, this one was an immense space spacecraft called the Access Arc, home of the Haltman Works Company, a company infamous across the galaxy for mechanizing entire planets and harvesting their natural resources. So in turn- Wow, it's like Amazon and 200 years in the future. And while Kirby was sleeping under a tree, King Dedede and Meta Knight watched on in horror as Planet Popstar was completely overwhelmed within a matter of minutes. Any he Yeah, what's your- Shitty little cannon's gonna do against this massive spaceship. soon proving to be futile. Though like always, not everything is exactly- How many times has Meta Knight's ship been shot down now? I swear God, every single time I see it, it's just getting shot down and exploded. As it seems. And this time, it won't take any extra modes to reveal that. So as Kirby retaliates against the access arc, destroying each of its five legs embedded into the planet, he meets the executive secretary of the company, Susie. And although she doesn't reveal all that much during- Fear me! I'm the executive! 
have Secretary! The scariest of all the secretaries. Her conversations with Kirby, she does mention a certain mother computer that will become extremely important in a bit, because once Kirby destroys all five legs and enters the access arc, he meets President Haltman, the supposed oh, mastermind no. behind the invasion of Popstar and all the planets before it. It's Jeffrey Bezos! After smugly introducing himself to Kirby, he reveals Star Dream, an extremely powerful supercomputer built using the blueprints and knowledge left behind by an Wait! Left behind by the ancients? I'm predicting it. Civilization. Ring any bells? Well, yes! after being beaten God, by Kirby, so smart. things take a turn for the worse. Because once the enraged Haltman decides to activate Star Dream, Susie jumps in and takes his control helmet off in the process, leaving yeah, him vulnerable get to be analyzed and assimilated into the now sentient computer. Though wait uh -oh. a second, why would she even do that? Well, once again, let's rewind everything a bit. By yet okay. again piecing together the information spread across countless pause screens throughout the game, long before the events of the main story, the Haltman works company was simply a robotics company led by Max Profit Haltman alongside his then- Wait, his name- <laughs> The CEO of the Megacorp is called Max Profit? Are you kidding me? A little on the nose there, isn't it, Hal Laboratory? Her daughter, Susanna, nicknamed Susie. At some point in their travels across space, as we already know, they came across the blueprints for a powerful wish-granting supercomputer and immediately began work on rebuilding it. However, during this process, meanwhile Haltman was testing Star Dream's space-time transport program, there was a terrible accident warping the young Susie oh, no. into another dimension. Thankfully, Susie- Was it a mirror dimension? would survive the ordeal and eventually return to her father as an adult. However, to her dismay, Haltman would not be the same man she remembered him as. You see, when the accident occurred, his name's Max Profit. His I can't had believe that. The process and stricken with grief, began to become obsessed with completing Star Dream in order to bring her back. Just call him greedy capitalism. Like, like wh why not? Unfortunately, though, due to Star Dream and its mental interface not being complete, Haltman began to lose both his compassion and memory of his daughter, changing the goal of his company from her revival to infinite prosperity. It also be at this point that Haltman would begin mechanizing planets and harvesting their resources. Infinite prosperity. We must maximize shareholder value! Capitalism is so good! As in the business plan drafted by Star Dream, it was the most effective way to maintain eternal prosperity for the company. However, by this point, Haltman still wasn't completely gone, and once he laid eyes on Susie for the first time in years, he sensed a faint familiarity with her, in turn making her his executive assistant. Going back to the climax of the main- But didn't Susie remember who her dad was? Like, wasn't she trying to convince him otherwise? Now, after seeing oh, what did I miss that? Become, in order to teach him a lesson, Susie had been making preparations to steal Star Dream and sell it off to any startup company that wanted it. <laughs> okay, just sell it off to a startup company. Not destroy it or like change it or like use it for the good of everything. Just, just, just sell it to a startup company. You know, why not? Fortunately, unbeknownst to anyone, after analyzing the universe through the Haltman Works Company and being exposed to the deranged Haltman's desire to mechanize everything, Star Dream had developed an extreme hatred for all forms of life. So as a result, once Susie interrupted the startup process of Star Dream, the computer took to a absorbing all that was left of Haltman's memories down to his very soul, fusing the two into oh, an all-powerful no. being bent on mass destruction. Of course, now, realizing the grave a mistake- powerful being bent on mass destruction? Yeah, it's just, this is literally Amazon. ...made, Susie completely changes her tune and sends Kirby on his way to take down the godlike supercomputer given the soul of a broken man. And just wait, because it doesn't end there. As Kirby fights Star Dream in the actual halberd of all things, to make itself stronger, Star Dream attaches itself to the Access Arc, transforming the entire uh -oh. ship into a sentient planet. It. Ironically oh, enough, so this good. also ends up completing Star Dream, as underneath the steel plating of the Access Arc, it's revealed that the entire ship was actually a repurposed clockwork star with- Oh no! Wait, so he's got like power of the ancients? He has the power of a star? Dude, this- it's over. Star it's a if Kirby can be, I'll be very impressed. Being the final piece to reactivate it. Yet again, a technology that was meant to be used for the good of everyone fallen into the wrong hands. And now it's being controlled by something that literally wants to wipe out all sentient life from the galaxy. Brilliant. Good, 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 good stuff. before we move on to the as of now final chunk of Kirby lore, Planet Robobot has a bit more in store for us. First off, like Superstar Ultra and Triple Deluxe, Robobot brought in yet another what-if scenario with Meta Nightmare Returns, a mode that while does give some pretty valuable pause screen info, has a finale that is just insane. So in this particular What If timeline, once Meta Knight defeats Haltman, Star Dream recognizes him as its new admin and decides uh -oh. to test his abilities. And again, oh, no. while this section doesn't really contain too much lore, it more just Man, goes to show just guy, how right? powerful Star Dream is, with it being capable of not only producing a clone of the original Dark- Oh, come on, he brings Dark Matter back? Come on, dude. Matter Swordsman, but Sectonia as well, with it even going as far as to summon Galactonite, who in retaliation immediately destroys the computer. Plus, hey- <laughs> 
turns around and he just collapses his cheeks. He brought him back. No gratitude whatsoever. He's supposed to be like the best swordsman in the galaxy. And he just turns around and immediately destroys him. That mode aside, in Robobot's true arena, there's another fun little tidbit Hell decided to sneak in. Basically, in the final, final, final phase of the Star Dream fight, when Star Dream sucks Kirby into its core, every time you destroy a piece of Star Dream's internal mechanisms, you can actually hear a distorted version of Haltman screaming in pain, showing oh, that no. while Star Dream had erased most of his soul, fragments of it still remain, forever oh, trapped within the malevolent Nova until someone destroys it for good. Oh, that's Though nasty. now, with all that said, we've reached the final stretch. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for quite possibly one of the most important lore dumps in Kirby history. With Here we go, baby! Kirby's star allies. Long ago, in deep space, a certain dark power was sealed away within a purple crystal called the Jemba Heart by a group of unknown heroes. They'd accomplished this by embedding several heart spears within the crystal to seal the evil away. However, many eons later, long after those said heroes had vanished, a new group arose who, instead of wanting to seal the darkness, revered it and yearned for its return. I love how the power of love is actually a thing in the Kirby lore. <laughs> One such member of this group came very close to their goal as well, succeeding in removing the heart spears trapping the darkness. The only problem problem was, since he didn't fully understand how to break the seal himself, the ritual went wrong, causing the Jemba heart to explode, sending- There seems to be a running theme of someone trying to uh, access a lot of power and then not, not understanding how it works. There was the guy with the Master Crown, there was Max Prophet who tried to log himself in and then he got uh, taken over. It always seems that whenever you try to get a ton of power, you get possessed. Uh, every time. Fragments all over the galaxy, Popstar included. So in turn, with the entire galaxy once again being at stake, Kirby set out to take action, and this time, he wasn't alone. You see, in terms of Kirby Meta games, Knights? Star Allies has honestly become the Infinity War of the series, with friends and foes from past games all- Dude, Avengers! Kirby Edition! ...together to help Kirby save the cosmos. And it's not like they're just shoved in to be in the game, as there's even explanations to some of the more unlikely allies coming to Kirby's aid. For Marx, as was shown in the True Arena cutscene in Superstar Ultra, he did actually manage to survive his head-on collision with Nova, only instead of taking revenge like he did in that timeline, he changed himself for the better. For Dark Meta Knight, probably nice the sketchiest dream friend out of them all. He's mainly just interested in the dark powers of the Jamba Heart, probably due to its similarity with his lost master. For direct Hey, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's what they say. It's Ratty Boy. Coach, well, he just wants to steal the Jamba Hearts for himself, as he thinks they're ordinary jewels. For of Teresa, course. sadly, he still hasn't been able to let go of Sectonia and believes that oh. if he goes to the altar of the Divine Terminus, he'll be able to bring her back to life. And Aww, finally, Oh, for... that's so sad. This poor guy, he's my favorite side character in Kirby now. Susie, I love him. In her late father's footsteps, she's begun to rebuild his company, determined to continue his work of mechanizing entire planets. Wait, whoa, 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 Susie! Susie, I thought you were good! Why? Why do you want to bring it back? Come on now! So okay, with the surface level stuff out of the way, let's get back to the main story. As Kirby liberated countless individuals who'd been plagued by the Jamba Dude, he's so yoked! He'd come across oh a my god! Spaceship that recently landed on Popstar, the Jam Bastion, housing three mage sisters intent on collecting the Jamba Hearts fragments. And while Kirby would end up thwarting their plans by defeating all three of them, it wouldn't slow down their master one bit. As once Kirby got to the Jam Vandra base, home to the three mage sisters and their master, it'd soon become pretty obvious what kind of being was sealed away within the Jamba Heart. Though by by far, aside from the absolutely massive amount of lore hidden in pause screens throughout the game, much- Is Meta Knight a good guy? I'm still trying to figure this out. He seems like he's always done good things, but it says he's corrupted, like though. Like before him, Highness, the mastermind behind the release of the Jamba Hearts, reveals an incredible amount of information solely through his quick conversation with Kirby. So for the sake of you all, and so we don't jump around too much, let's- His name is Highness. Dude, the names they gave are so on the nose. Start from the very beginning. As we already know, long ago, there existed the Ancients. Yes. A widespread civilization responsible for a lot of the things you see in Kirby games. However, what we didn't know until now is that the Ancients were actually split into two factions. Those who relied on science and machines, and those who relied on magic, with the latter also dabbling with dark matter. For a while, uh -oh. the two seemed to coexist with one another, with the magical Ancients even being the ones to stop a galactic crisis that threatened everything, which- Oh, so Highness is one of the Ancients, I got you. While not confirmed, is heavily implied to be Galactonite. Plus, this is also supported okay. by the fact that he comes out of a portal Highness made in the what-if mode of Star Allies. Though one day, for some unknown reason, the scientific Ancients decided their magical counterparts were too much of a threat and betrayed them by banishing them to the edge of the galaxy in fear. 
Oh, that's nasty. That's always how it goes. That's always like human nature is when something's getting strong, you have to strike before they get you. Why can't we just be happy? Why can't we all just be Kirby? There's their dominion over dark matter. And it's not like the magical ancients were even remotely evil either. Just take Highness. Long before his clan was betrayed and banished, he was actually a very kind individual. For instance, when he used to travel freely across worlds, he happened upon three girls. One nearly freezing to death in a blizzard, one burning alive in an inferno, and one being on the verge of death right after she attempted to take her own life by getting struck by lightning. In Whoa, that is a really convoluted way to commit a video game over. That's re- All Okay, sure. Highness saved them, at the same time unlocking their hidden potential for certain types of magic. Though after being betrayed by the scientific ancient, his once kindly heart began to become consumed by hatred and obsession. It'd be at this point that the now insane Highness would form a religion based around dark matter, believing that if he obtained and freed the being trapped within the Jamba heart, that it'd deliver him and his followers to a promised land of sorts. At the same time, restoring- Yeah, religion does get a little funky like that, doesn't it? now shattered clan. So when Kirby finally makes it to the Divine Terminus, where Highness had been performing his ritual for who knows how long, he'd completely lost himself to the darkness within his heart, becoming the exact opposite of what he oh, once he was. Oh, he looks like Hypno! He came to the three sisters Jesus Christ! Beyond ago, Highness, in his insane state, only saw them as tools to be used, becoming abusive towards them at times. Even when- oh, he just slapped them! He's just like, shut up, bitch! And just Highness was defeated. Them. He'd become so obsessed with the revival of his Dark Lord that he sacrificed not only the three sisters to it, but himself, fueling the complete oh, revival uh -oh. of Void Termina. Now it yeah, that is religious fervor just on steroids. Speaking First, of steroids, look at you! Appears to be a massive hulking titan with incredibly destructive powers. You know what you'd expect from a destroyer of worlds. But as the fight progresses, clearly there's something more to the humanoid than meets the eye. Just oh, he's got an eye! He's got the eye! Is he Dark Man? It's third phase, where alongside sprouting wings that look pretty familiar, it summons yep. a replica of the Master Crown, all but confirming Void Termina to be the force controlling the original all along. But most importantly- So he- he has the Master Crown too? So he's- yeah, he's literally the originator the of everything. Void Termina's fourth phase, where it straight up pulls an Earthbound and copies what? Kirby's face. What does this mean? Well, we'll get there in a second. Be Kirby is the antithesis of a Void Termina and they are two sides of the same coin based on a primordial being that split in half. One positive, one negative. Am I right? As alongside Kirby's face, as he progressed through the fight, Void Termina confirms what the entire game had been alluding to. The fact that not only is it dark matter, but it's the source of it. Now I know I'm kind of encroaching okay. on theory it's the source of dark matter, here, sure. hear me out, because this just lines up too perfectly. As stated in various pause screens, Void, aka dark matter, exists in all dimensions, accounting for instances like Dark Mind in the Mirror World and even Dark Crafter in Kirby and the Rainbow Curse's Seventopia. Though by far, the most game-changing piece of new information expressed by these pause screens is the true nature of Dark Matter. Remember how in the Dark Matter trilogy, Zero's only real weakness was the power of positive emotions? Well, it turns yeah. out that was a lot more important than we ever realized, because uh -huh. in this pause screen right here, it's revealed that depending on the type of energy that's gathered, Dark Matter will not always necessarily be a force of evil, explaining how Gooey even came to be. But aside okay. from all that, using the information we get from pause screens and the fact that Void Termina's roar is literally just a slower version of Kirby's voice, there's a pretty good chance Void Termina is actually related to Kirby. With the oh, I was saying, I was saying it there. There's one primordial thing that got split in half. One good, one bad. That's heavily alluding to the fact that if Void Termina was born using purely positive energy, he could very well end up looking a lot like our titular Pink Puff rather than a dark monstrosity. Or and maybe they note, came from the same origin. Like there was, there was a good Kirby. Kirby is like what? It's gorillion years old. Taking all of that into consideration, not only does this game pretty much spell out the origin of dark matter, but from the information we're given, Kirby himself may very well be the outcome of Void being birthed with pure positive energy. So there That's you have it, right? right all of Kirby close. were wrapped up nicely with an elder god. Well, not just yet, because after Kirby is gone. defeated, Highness would fall into a dimensional rift, absorbing all the dark energy Void left behind and encasing himself in yet another Jamba heart. So in turn, once Kirby releases him and defeats him in his corrupted state, the three mage sisters who've also been corrupted challenge Kirby as well, leading to him both defeating them again and purifying them with what a friend What is this heart, insane boss rush at the end? That had plagued them for so long. In fact, this is honestly a pretty happy ending in Kirby terms, what with there being no dead dads and no dead crushes. Plus, in a completion picture for the mo- Kirby just 
just so much murder, it's ridiculous. And also, Kirby is the purifier. If you can go around purifying everything that is corrupted by this dark matter, by this void creature, then that would imply that they are two sides of the same coin, right? It seems like even Highness has finally begun returning to his old ways, relaxing with the three mage sisters on a beach. But wait just a second, since while Highness seems to have finally found peace within himself, there's one more looming entity I haven't touched on. If uh -oh. you thought the lore around Void Termina was convoluted, then oh boy, you haven't seen anything yet. So okay, in Star Allies, there's a what-if mode called Guest Star Allies, where it depicts what would happen if one of Kirby's friends confronted Highness instead of Kirby himself. And like always, <laughs> Waddle Dee confronted him, <laughs> imagine. It's only the finale itself that really has any noticeable changes, since instead of fighting Void Termina, Highness instead decides to open up an interdimensional portal, once again releasing Galactonite onto the world. Except things don't- Galactonite, the strongest uh, swordsman in the galaxy who the highness sealed away because he was the magical ancient that sealed away, so Meta Knight might have to fight no, him, I guess. Is he going to be able to fight him? Instead, a familiar butterfly lands on the tip of his sword, completely absorbing Galactonite's immense power and creating what? Morpho Knight, a mysterious what? warrior whose design actually originated from the cancelled Kirby GameCube game. What the so hell? As cool and completely random as Morpho Knight is, let's what the touch on that what? butterfly for a second because I'm not joking when I say it's literally been with Kirby all along. While the Wait, the butterfly that has been chilling with Kirby just absorbed the strongest swordsman in the galaxy and why, why would he- The specific orange one has only appeared in every mainline game since Return to Dreamland. Butterflies in general have been appearing alongside Kirby ever since the very first game, meaning a being capable of absorbing the actual strongest warrior in the galaxy has been with us this whole time. He's just been big chilling. Thing, what in the actual hell is even happening anymore with Kirby lore? And honestly, for this one, I share your sentiment. As of now, Morpho Knight and the nature of the butterfly are mostly shrouded in mystery. History, with the only real information about them being the fact that the butterfly is a supposed being of paradise, and that Morpho Knight is associated with a judgment day of sorts, meaning Morpho Knight is somehow related to the Kirby afterlife? Absolutely insane, I is know. Is Morpho so Knight well, the end times bringer? The, the bringer of destruction and the end of the universe? That's about it. Well, that's ridiculous. I feel like I've learned a ton today. I didn't realize Kirby law was as dark as it is, and there was so much murder going on, but that's kind of crazy. But please, make sure that you do subscribe and go and check out the RPG Mongus channel, who I just watched the entire video of. So please, make sure you go and subscribe to them. Thank you so much for watching. If you want me to do more Kirby Law reactions, or even just reactions to other lore that I don't really know anything about, like, for example, Kingdom Hearts, although that would take four hours, uh, please let me know in the comment section below. Thanks.